Good afternoon. Is everyone ready for a slight change? Uh, the table really is not symbolic of any real <laughs> separation between Bill, Manisha, and I. I'm Eileen uh, Gotts, and I'm going to be moderating a panel that's going to focus on uh, giving you some sense of what's been happening on uh, enforcement activities, uh, focusing not only on mergers, but also on consumer protection. And uh, we have two fantastic uh, speakers today on this panel. Uh, all the way to my left, we have Manisha uh, Sheth. And Manisha is fairly new in the job, but I think really has uh, hit the ground running. She serves as the Executive Direct Deputy Attorney General for Economic Justice for the State of New York. That's a big mouthful. It's a lot uh, of <laughs> and she leads five litigation bureaus at the New York Attorney General's office. Uh, it includes investor protection, antitrust, internet and technology, consumer frauds, and real estate finance. Uh, but I, she's really up to the task, having pr previously uh, been a partner at the Quinn Emanuel firm. And uh, not quite as new at the job uh, is Bill Efron. Bill is right now the uh, Northeast Region Director for the Federal Trade Commission. And he's had that role for a little bit over eight years now. Uh, and it's hard to believe, but uh, during his day job, he was uh, running the entire uh, office while uh, until recently he was the main trial lawyer in a case we're going to hear a lot about, which is a merger case uh, involving Penn Hershey. Uh, and with that, I think uh, perhaps we start with you, Manisha. Sure. Be okay? Great. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for inviting me to this year's Big Law Business Summit and giving me the opportunity to talk with you all. And I apologize in advance for my voice. I just managed to catch the office bug and am battling this, uh, this bug. Um, as Eileen mentioned, we over the Economic Justice Division at the New York Attorney General oversees five litigation bureaus. Um, I would say that the mission of the division is to improve the economic well-being of all New Yorkers by ensuring that consumers and investors are protected from fraudulent, deceptive, and illegal business practices. And also that our markets are fair, efficient, and transparent so that we have a level playing field for all market participants. Um, one of the things that I think probably will be of, of interest to all of you is the changing federal landscape in Washington and how this impacts the state's enforcement priorities. And so I wanted to cover that topic in the context of first antitrust and then also consumer and investor protection. Um, so starting with antitrust enforcement, um, the one area that I think is, um, that has agreement on both sides of the aisle is price fixing cartels. Um, notwithstanding any change in leadership, I think it's very likely that our federal counterparts at the Department of Justice will continue to aggressively investigate and prosecute both national and international um, cartels for bid rigging, price fixing, and other collusive activities in violation of Section 1 of the Antitrust um, of the Sherman Act. Um, now, the New York Attorney General's Office will continue to coordinate with Maine Justice um, in these efforts where there is an impact on New York communities, New York consumers, New York markets, New York businesses. And mo currently, the most prominent of these joint investigations is one you've probably all heard of. It was in the news this morning, the multi-state complaint against a number of generic drug companies for allegedly engaging in a broad well-coordinated and long-standing or long-running scheme to fix prices and allocate markets and cut customers in the, for a number of generic drugs in the United States. Now, the DOJ has already obtained a number of guilty pleas of executives from two individuals and led by Connecticut, New York, and approximately 38 other states are pursuing this, these price-fixing claims on a civil basis under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Um, another prominent matter that um, you may have heard of that also affects the healthcare market is the office's joint investigation of alleged collusion um, by suppliers of saline. And saline is one of the most widely used products in hospitals. Now, in, these, in addition to these national cases, the New York Attorney General will continue to focus its efforts 
its enforcement efforts on conspiracies between and among New York businesses, but also conspiracies that have a predominantly local impact on New York markets. And one example from the recent past is the joint DOJ and New York prosecution of two New York City bus companies, bus tour operators, that um, created a joint venture between them with the intent to eliminate competition between them and, in effect, create a monopoly in the hop-on, hop-off tour bus market in New York City. In fact, these, these two uh, bus operators used the joint venture to raise fares by 10%. Um, this case was successfully resolved through a settlement, uh, pursuant to which the defendants agreed to divest 50 bus stops in Manhattan, and they also agreed to pay $7.5 million in disgorgement of the, to disgorge the uh, illegal profits that they received um, by operating this illegal joint venture for six years. And this was on top of the $19 million in restitution that was obtained as a result of a settlement in a private class action. Now, we've heard recently um, from President Trump that uh, there may be um, major infrastructure uh, projects that happen in New York State. And um, to the extent that that occurs, our office, the New York Attorney General's office, will be vigilant in ensuring that any bidding on such projects is not infected with uh, anti-competitive practices. In fact, the office has a number of ongoing active investigations into bid rigging that affects New York State procurement entities. And I can tell you that investigations and prosecutions of those who defraud New York State procurement agencies and as a result, New York taxpayers will be a top priority. And given that the AG's office has the authority <clears throat> excuse me, to bring criminal charges under the Donnelly Act, we will not hesitate to bring such charges where appropriate for hardcore price fixing and bid rigging activities. Turning to Section 2, um, monopolization investigations by the FTC and the DOJ were relatively rare during the Obama administration, and we don't expect there to be um, much change in that regard with our federal <coughs> counterparts. And New York has traditionally and historically pursued those cases, the Section 2 cases, where there's a substantial harm to a New York consumer, to New York consumers, or to a New York market. And this will not change. These investigations tend to be long, complex, and require a lot of resources. That said, the New York AG will continue to focus its resources on cases, one, where there's a unilateral conduct that is aimed at foreclosing competition, and two, where such conduct has an anti-competitive effect in New York by harming consumers and businesses. And there's a number of industries where there's a potential for this type of abuse of a monopoly power, including healthcare, fintech, and the entertainment industry. For example, in the pharmaceutical sector, we have seen anti-competitive conduct by incumbent drug, drug companies that are intent on improperly maintaining their monopoly power. And this conduct includes, among other things, one, engaging in restrictive distribution arrangements that prevent generics from obtaining samples of branded drugs for bioequivalence testing. Two, product hopping, and this was um, the focus of the New York Attorney General's case against, case against Namenda, um, an anti-Alzheimer's medication. And three, exclusive arrangements with suppliers of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Um, with regard to merger enforcement, um, there are a number of large merger investigations that are pending with the FTC, the DOJ, and our office. And as many of you know, one recent and very visible case in which we cooperated with the DOJ uh, was the recently terminated Anthem Cigna merger. And this was a great model for federal state cooperation, and we really would like to see that cooperation continue, particularly given the increased concern about record levels of industry coordination, uh, industry con concentration, and the increasing difficulties of fashioning relief in the face of such um, concentration. And one open question will be, what role will the states play if federal enforcement uh, with regard to mergers um, is rolled back? And this is a concern that has been expressed to our office 
by both businesses and consumer groups alike. Um, and it's important to remember that the states have historically had and continue to have extensive powers to investigate and challenge mergers. And they often can sue for injunctive relief, not only at a local level, but also at a national level. So I don't think it'll be a surprise to anyone to hear that the New York AG um, is taking appropriate steps to ensure that states can fill this void to the extent it does occur. Now, let me turn now to consumer and investor protection areas. Um, there re much remains to be seen in these areas. Uh, as we sit here today, the D.C. Circuit um, is rehearing on Bonk argument on the constitutionality of the, CFP of the independent single director structure of the CFPB. And meanwhile, in Congress, um, it remains to be seen how far the Choice Act and its accompanying rollback of Dodd-Frank and its protections, including a proposal to strip the CFTC of its authority to file suits over alleged unfair, deceptive, um, or abusive acts and practices, how far that will go. But in the interim, I think we can expect to see continued vigorous enforcement at the state level, and this office's priorities in terms of consumer protection are, one, housing and um, mortgages, two, education and training, and three, health and safety. Now, first, with regard to housing and mortgages, the office investigates and prosecutes a number of deceptive and fraudulent practices aimed at homeowners and rent-regulated tenants. There are a number of active investigations in the office um, of various deceptive practices by mortgage lenders, mortgage servicers, and most recently, private equity firms who have invested in real estate. Now, second, the office has investigated and continues to investigate a number of for-profit colleges and other educational and vocational establishments and student loan servicers the most famous of which was our litigation against the Trump University, which recently resulted in a settlement earlier this year of $25 million. Now, the office has been focusing its efforts on those institutions that claim to provide or that sell services to students that are useless services, and they're selling them under the guise of being educational or vocational services. We've also prioritized those um, cases where entities are falsely inflating the job placement statistics um, or job placement rates after graduation. And third, where they engage in deceptive student loan servicing practices. Now, this last area is particularly um, likely to be a focus given the rollback on the federal enforcement side. As many of you know, on April 11th, the Department of Education revoked a number of important student, student loan servicing reforms. And these included um, uh, measures that compelled or directed the Department of Education to include incentives in its contracts with servicers that encourage servicers to help borrowers stay current on their loans rather than and avoid default. They also set up monitoring of servicers to integrate complaint resolution into oversight of servicers and considered servicers' past performance in determining whether or not to give business to that particular servicer. And finally, these reforms created new requirements for payment processing, such as a requirement that the loan be, the service, the payments be applied in such a way that, um, that benefited the borrower. Now, in the face of these rollbacks and these student protections, it will be incumbent on the states to continue their efforts to protect students from deceptive student loan servicing practices. And third, the office has prioritized cases that endanger the health and safety of New Yorkers. Earlier this year, the New York Attorney General, along with our friends at the FTC, filed a lawsuit against a major dietary supplement manufacturer that was alleged to have fraudulently marketed a dietary supplement to senior citizens, to the elderly, as a, as a way to combat memory loss and cognitive dysfunction, despite the alleged lack of any substantiation for such claims. Now, in the area of investor protection, this office will continue to look for industries and markets where entities are taking advantage of an informational asymmetry at the expense of institutional and retail investors. We saw this in the last financial crisis in the area of residential mortgage-backed securitizations, 
where sponsors and underwriters had access to information that showed them that the quality of the loans in the securitizations was poor, that they did not comply with guidelines, and yet that information was not available to investors and was not disclosed to investors when they purchased these residential mortgage-backed securities. Now, let me close with two requests to you all. Um, first, we've all seen that sign on the subway. If you see something, say something. Um, you all are on the front lines in your respective industries or you're representing clients who are on the, first line, on the front lines. Um, you may be seeing practices and conduct that firsthand or learning of it through your colleagues that either don't sit right with you or just don't add up. Let us know what you're seeing. Let us know what you're hearing and how it's impacting your businesses and your consumers. We, ha we often have law firms come to us to meet with us and approach us about new investigations into misconduct that they are seeing. And oftentimes a law firm may have already commenced a litigation and they realize that in the course of doing so, this problem affects a broader group of people or affects markets. And in other cases, it may be, there may not be a sufficient, num a sufficient amount of potential damages for any single investor to bring, a single plaintiff to bring a case, or there could be class certification hurdles or hurdles relating to mandatory arbitration. But remember that these hurdles are not um, applicable in many instances to the New York Attorney General in our law enforcement capacity. And as a result, we are well situated to investigate and prosecute any potential misconduct and, more importantly, reach a resolution that goes beyond in the imposition of monetary relief and instead helps us fashion relief of practices, bad practices going forward. So I encourage you to contact us, to meet with us, educate us about your industry so that we can together combat deceptive practices. Um, call me, uh, reach out to anyone in, in my office. I've got five great bureau chiefs, um, all willing to take a meeting or a call to learn how, how we can better serve the community. Um, my second request is we live in a world of changing technology. Technology is rapidly evolving. There are new businesses, new ways of doing business, whether it's telemed or fintech, and yet there are benefits and potential risks associated with this. And so we want to do our part to encourage innovation and reduce barriers to entry. But at the same time, we want to strike a balance in protecting consumers, investors, and businesses. So in this vein, I also ask you, contact us, meet with us, educate us about this innovation, what barriers you are facing, um, and we seek your help in ensuring that uh, innovators are not facing barriers to entry raised by incumbents, but also that innovation does not come at the expense of consumers and competition. So thank you, and I hope that you'll accept this call to action to um, foster additional public-private partnerships in the pursuit of economic justice. I, I don't want to eat into Bill's time, but I think we're going to hear that Bill's phone line is also yeah. <laughs> open, even with the change of administration. And the one thing I kind of, you might say, what Northeast region, uh, the, isn't the FTC in Washington? And I think what you're going to hear is there are uh, the regions, especially the Northeast region of the FTC, uh, has real responsibility uh, not only for uh, what would be localized uh, matters, but for, for instance, in the financial sector and in pharma and other things. And so with that, I want to turn it over to you, Bill. Well, thanks so much, Eileen. Really happy to be here. Happy to be here with my fellow state, uh, my fellow enforcer, Manisha. Um, just before beginning, I'll just get out the standard disclaimer that I'm speaking for myself and the statements I make and the views I express here today are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of the commission or any individual commissioner. Um, as Eileen alluded to, uh, I'll just say a few words about the Northeast region. So uh, in my capacity as regional director, um, on behalf of the Bureau of Competition, uh, we oversee litigations and investigations that relate both to mergers uh, and conduct, and that's in an array of industries. And then similarly, I also supervise, uh, on behalf of the Bureau of Consumer Protection, um, investigations and litigations involving unfair uh, and deceptive practices. So we do, we do cover a lot of, of, of ground. And as Eileen mentioned, those, those cases 
cases are not only uh, in, in, in our region, but those cases have nationwide impact. Um, I wanted to focus today um, on some of the recent uh, antitrust enforcement highlights. And what I'd like to talk about with the limited time we have are just a few of the merger challenges that happened at the Commission this year. Uh, notably, uh, the FTC blocked three mergers uh, in court this year, um, and in, in so doing, we preserved competition uh, in the market uh, for office supplies sold to large business customers and in two local hospital markets. Uh, let me start with the Staples Office Depot case, which I'm sure many of you have, have read about. So just by way of brief background, in December of 2015, uh, the Commission unanimously authorized a challenge to Staples' $6.5 billion acquisition of Office Depot. Uh, the FTC and its co-plaintiffs, we often uh, partner with, with, with states, um, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in this case and the District of Columbia, uh, sought a preliminary injunction in federal court. And the plaintiffs alleged here that the proposed acquisition uh, would significantly reduce competition uh, in the market for the sale and distribution of core consumable office supplies and paper sold to large business-to-business -business customers for their own use. And the complaint further alleged that in competing for these contracts, Staples and Office Depot would provide the low prices, uh, the nationwide next day distribution, and a combination of services and features that many large business customers require. Uh, we also allege that uh, by eliminating this competition between Staples and Office Depot, uh, the transaction would lead to higher prices and lower quality. Uh, a, a preliminary injunction hearing took place last year, uh, and Judge Emmett Sullivan, United States District Court uh, Judge for the District of Columbia, uh, granted the plaintiff's motion for a preliminary injunction. Um, and in granting the motion, uh, the court concluded that the plaintiffs uh, had established their prima facie case uh, by demonstrating that the proposed merger uh, was likely to reduce competition in the business-to-business -business contract uh, space for office supplies. And shortly after the court's order, uh, Staples and Office Depot abandoned their proposed merger. Uh, now, Eileen had earlier alluded to, and so did I, to hospital mergers. So let me, let me discuss the, the Hershey case. This is the Hershey Pinnacle Hospital merger, uh, where in September uh, the commission obtained a Third Circuit appellate court victory. Uh, this was a case that was litigated by the Northeast region. Uh, by way of brief background, uh, the FTC and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, brought suit to preliminarily enjoin the proposed merger of the two largest health care systems in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area, uh, pending the outcome of the FTC's adjudicative administration uh, on the merits. Um, the government alleged that the merger uh, would substantially lessen competition in the market for general acute care inpatient hospital services sold to commercial insurers in the Harrisburg area, which the government defined as a four-county area in and around Harrisburg. And the government further alleged that the merged system would control 76 percent of the market, and therefore this would significantly increase concentration in an already concentrated market, rendering this merger presumptively unlawful. And geographic market definition was the key to this case at trial uh, and on appeal. And, and the crux of the government's case with respect to geographic market was that the evidence showed that insurers needed Harrisburg area hospitals uh, in their networks because area residents overwhelmingly want local hospital care. And because of this demand, insurers could not market a network to Harrisburg area employers without any Harrisburg area hospitals. And, and therefore, insurers would pay a price increase to avoid that result. And accordingly, uh, the Harrisburg area satisfied the hypothetical monopolist <laughs> test. So a five-day hearing uh, was held last April. And afterwards, the district court judge in May uh, denied the government's motion on the basis that we had failed to prove a relevant geographic market. And the court focused on the fact that 43.5 percent of Hershey's patients came from outside the Harrisburg area. And this indicated to the district court that the government's proposed geographic market was, was too narrow. So the government appealed this decision uh, to the Third Circuit. And the Third Circuit uh, reversed the district court's denial of the preliminary injunction, uh, concluding that the district court uh, had incorrectly formulated and misapplied the standard, <coughs> the proper standard, for determining the relevant geographic market. 
So I'd just like to go over the three errors in the, uh, in the district court's analysis that the Third Circuit found. Uh, the first was, is the court explained that by relying uh, almost exclusively on patient flow data, essentially the number of patients that enter the proposed market, that the district court's analysis more closely aligned with a discredited economic theory uh, as opposed to the hypothetical monopolist test. And in relying on this patient flow data, the court had, the district court had applied what's known as the Elzinga-Hogarty test. And although this was once the preferred method uh, to analyze geographic market in hospital merger cases, uh, subsequent empirical research has shown that the test can lead to divining overly broad uh, geographic markets in hospital cases. So, the second error that the court identified uh, was that the district court focused on the likely response of patients to a price increase and completely neglected any mention of the likely response of insurers. Uh, and in other words, by using this patient flow data as its primary source of evidence to determine the market was too narrow, the district court failed to account for the likely response of insurers to a price increase. And the reason why the analysis must properly take account for that is, is that patients in large part do not feel the impact of a price increase, uh, but insurers do. And finally, uh, the third error committed by the district court uh, was that it grounded its reasoning in part on private temporary rate protection agreements that the two merging hospitals had entered into with the two largest insurers in the Harrisburg area, uh, even though these types of contracts are not relevant to determining the relevant geographic market. So the court went on to hold uh, that the government had met its burden to properly define the relevant geographic market and concluded that defendants had not rebutted uh, the government's prima facie case that the merger was likely to be anti-competitive. Um, accordingly, uh, the court found that uh, the, the government was likely to succeed on the merits and the Court of Appeals uh, remanded the case uh, and directed the district court to enter the preliminary injunction uh, in favor of the government. And shortly thereafter, uh, Hershey and Pinnacle abandoned the proposed merger. Now, about one month later, uh, after the Third Circuit issued its decision, uh, the Commission achieved yet another appellate court victory in the hospital merger context when the Seventh Circuit issued its decision in the Advocate North Shore case. Um, and an advocate, the FTC, and this time the state of Illinois, uh, sued in federal court to enjoin a merger of Advocate and North Shore. These, were, these are two nonprofit hospital systems. Um, now, in its complaint, the government alleged that these two entities would create by far uh, the largest hospital system in Chicago's North Shore area, and they would control about 60% of the market. So in June of 2016, uh, the district court uh, held a hearing and again denied the government's motion on the basis that they failed to prove a relevant geographic market. Uh, the government also appealed in this case and uh, last October, uh, the Seventh Circuit reversed the district court's denial, uh, holding that the district court's uh, geographic market finding was clearly erroneous. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between the Third Circuit case and the Seventh Circuit case, which I won't get into and we don't have time for, but there was a, the court's opinion included an extensive discussion uh, of how the academics evolving understanding of hospital markets and how geographic market um, is most directly about the likely response of insurers. Um, but, it, but in any event, the Seventh Circuit remanded the case. Um, the district court, after further briefing, um, entered the injunction in favor of the government, and shortly thereafter, um, the, the parties to the merger abandoned the deal. Um, I wish we had more time to get into some of the, uh, the data security work that the uh, commission does, but we'll, we'll have to do that at another, uh, at another session. So I appreciate everybody's, uh, I appreciate everybody's time. I wanted to thank both of you. I think the rumors of the death of antitrust enforcement at the uh, federal level are greatly exaggerated. been doing this for 33 years, and I do expect that uh, both uh, your uh, agencies are going to keep us busy in the future. So join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>